Jesus Christ is Lord. We want to just bless everybody. This water represents our new life, that we are born again, that we have a new nature in Christ Jesus. That's you. You're a brother to Christ. You're a sister to Christ. You're a child of God. Your Father owns it all and made it all. How glorious is your life because of your new life in Christ. This is Daily Bread. I'm Father Al Lauer, and we are in the third part of an eight-part series on building a new life in the Spirit. I'll point it out on our easel here. Building a new life in the Spirit. The key to doing that is facing some basic realities. We mentioned the reality of our fallen human nature and our new nature in Christ by faith through baptism. The reality of Satan, the reality of eternity, the reality of Jesus' divinity. Now, that was just our introduction. That just gave us the basic principle. And now as you start to build a new life in the power of the Holy Spirit, you, where do you start? Now, the mistake I've made many times is, well, you start with a foundation. Any stupid idiot knows that. You start with a foundation. Wrong. Wrong. That is a mistake I've made so many times. I came up to a person, say, well, the foundation is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you can't build on anything but the rock foundation of Jesus Christ. So that's what I told him. And that's right. And I said, well, just give yourself to Jesus and that's, that'll do it. Well, yes, but there was more to it than that. These people were not just a black, just like a a blank uh, blackboard. <laughs> these, uh, everybody has been living for years. And it wasn't that the devil never even touched these people or they've never twisted or distorted their lives over these years of living without the new nature of Jesus Christ. The devil has been doing some building himself. 2 Corinthians in chapter 10, verse 4, I noted this on our easel here. It says that we can bring down the strongholds of the evil one. We can demolish his sophistries, bring down his proud pretensions, and make every thought captive. The devil's been building himself. And uh, if we are going to build, we got to clear the site. I forgot to do that so many times, and it really showed up later on. Oh, I was building this person uh, in the Lord, I gave them a chance to have their foundation on Jesus. And we started being built up in the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, it was wonderful, but we seem to have these problems. Oh, it's just technical difficulties. We'll get through those. Well, we did, but then there we are again. More problems, more problems. And now we don't seem to be overcoming them. Finally, we get bogged down. Finally, things start to fall apart. Say, what happened? I don't understand. They gave their life to Jesus. They got the Holy Spirit moving in their lives. And what happened? Well, there seems to be things from the past that, that just kept coming back. And those things should have been cleared out. But they weren't. We needed to face the reality, I'm going to write it here, of repentance. I don't know if you'll be able to read this or not. I hope you can. Repentance. Um, we, the person said, oh, I repent, but it really wasn't deep enough. It, it wasn't uh, total enough. It wasn't the full thing. You know, John the baptizer came, and he came on much stronger about repentance, preparing the way for Jesus. He, he came for a baptism of repentance. For an, a baptism, that word, the root word of that means an immersion in. And they're not talking just about water. They're talking about reality. They're saying getting immersed in the reality of repentance, getting totally involved in the reality of repentance. The people came up and said, I repent. And John the baptizer, instead of saying, great, he said, I, I don't know if you really know what you mean. I don't know if you're really committed. Uh, prove it to me. Prove it to me that you repented. You see what I mean? We need to um, 
get more serious about repentance and not be careless about this. We must face the reality of our human nature. Our human nature doesn't want to repent. And even when it says it wants to repent, it, it really isn't getting into it. It's just going over the surface. We must face that. We must face that the devil is trying to confuse us. Oh, you repented. You repented of something, but you didn't repent of all this other stuff. And he's lying to us. We've got to face some realities focused on this reality of realities, repentance. And when we don't do that, we keep building and things keep falling apart and we keep wondering what the trouble is. Well, the trouble is, right from the word go, we did not clear away all that junk from the past. And, and that stuff just keeps causing trouble. Now, you look at the Bible, for example, in 2 Corinthians and chapter, um, let me look at chapter 6. You just can't let all that old stuff from the past hang around. You got to clear it out. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not yoke yourselves in a mismatch with unbelievers. After all, what do righteousness and lawlessness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What accord is there between Christ and Belial? What common lot between believer and unbeliever? Tell me what agreement there is between the temple of God and idols. You are the temple of the living God. You can't have this temple to idols right next to the temple of the living God. That temple to idols has got to go. That old lifestyle that's been built up, that stronghold of the evil one, that has got to go. And when we talk about repentance, we're not talking about just uh, thinking a little different. We've got to move some of that stuff out. In fact, all of that stuff out. In 2 Kings 23, when the great king Josiah was bringing reform to the people, he went and he had to just tear down all those pagan altars and pagan shrines and all those sacred poles and all, you know, and he spent... It was, there was so much stuff he had to clear out. Now, when we don't do that, we run into problems later on. And the cause of those problems is that we never face the reality of how deep and total repentance needs to be. Let me explain this a little bit more. Another way of saying clearing the building site, how do you clear it? Now, just imagine this visually. You know, here you are. You're going to try to build this wonderful temple to the Lord. But, hey, on the site that you're going to build it, there's already a temple. And it ain't to the Lord. It's to the devil. It's a stronghold of the evil one. And we are living stones in that temple. Now, we can't be in the temple of the devil and in the temple of the Lord at the same time. We're part of the materials. You can't say, well, I'm in two buildings at the same time. No, we, we can't bilocate. If we are in that old building, we can't be in that new building. So we move to the new building, but there's still a lot of stuff that's been built up in that old building. We've got to just clear that stuff out. Now, maybe the old building ain't what it used to be. I hope it ain't. But it needs to be more, more than that. It needs to be leveled and removed from the site. Now, um, like when the Maccabees went into the temple that had been desecrated, and they put the statue of the pagan god Zeus right on the altar, and they did all kinds of other th terrible things. You know, when they went in there, they didn't just say, well, let's start praying. No, they said, we've got to clear this place out. We have to cleanse this temple. And then we can proceed. Clear it, clear it out. Clear that site out. And so here you got this old thing. Well, how do you clear it out? Well, um, say here's this building, this stronghold of the evil one. Will you knock a couple shingles off the top? Oh, that's not going to get rid of it. You knock a couple bricks off the top, that's not going to get rid of it. You have to hit it at the bottom. And the whole thing will topple. You have to hit it where it's just going to fall right apart. Now, that is what you might call a sin center. Let me 
Uh, as you might have guessed, I don't know if you've guessed it yet, I hope you have if you're at all perceptive, I'm not too good at writing, drawing, or any of this kind of stuff. I don't seem to even be that good at erasing here either, but we're, we're trying to do this. Uh, but let me try, and if uh, I'm sure you'll get a kick out of this. I hope you will. <laughs> um, here's a building with different blocks to it. I'm glad I'm telling you what it is in case you would never guess. Uh, so here we have these, these blocks. And, um, you know, this is, a, this is a stronghold of the devil. Maybe right here we have self-hatred. I'll just put SH down there. And then we have pride here at the bottom. And we have unforgiveness. UNF. Yeah, boy, that's really hard to figure that one out. Okay, and uh, maybe good old-fashioned greed here. Then on top of that, you know, we've got um, just kind of um, lust, maybe a little anger, um, maybe a little some resentment. Then on that, on top of that, we got some alcoholism. Now. I don't know if you know what all that stuff stands for, but here it is. There's a little little stronghold. Most people think it would be a big one. The bottom is greed, unforgiveness, pride, self-hatred, second layer, lust, anger, resentment, top one, alcoholism. Now, that's the stronghold. How do you knock this stronghold over? Now, a lot of people say, this guy's an alcoholic. We're going to tell him he has to quit drinking so much. And to see, you try to knock that out, and you're not going to be very successful. You're not going to be very successful in doing that. Even if he quits being an alcoholic, he still has some major problems. Uh, how many times a person alcoholic, they've been raised in hell for years, finally they get rid of it. Amazingly, guess what happens? They get divorced right after they get sober. And that doesn't make any sense. You'd figure if she could put up with him after all those years of drinking, uh, she wouldn't divorce him when, when he gets sober. But see, there hasn't been a real major change here. This man still has greed, unforgiveness, pride, self-hatred, lust, anger, and resentment. And just because he's not drinking all the time, is this person anybody to live with? Of course he isn't. There has not been a real change here. All he did is knock a brick off the top. What really has to happen would be to hit one of these bottoms, especially the center. Like, for example, this is only an example, but it's a very common example. This one right here, unforgiveness, right at the bottom. Maybe there's alcoholism up here and drug addiction. And on top of that, some sort of um, pornography. And then there's some irresponsibility, and then um, just um, prejudice, racism. You know, here this is a terrible thing. But you know, you know how to demolish this thing, how to clear the site, how to, you don't knock off the racism. You can't get that by itself. Oh, you can try, but the person still has got a terrible heart. You go for that unforgiveness on the bottom line there. You knock that over. It's like the old milk bottle routine, you know, at the county fairs. You knock that bottom milk bottle in the center off, and the whole thing goes down. And what, what you need to do, everybody's talking to this guy about his drinking. Or everybody's talking to this guy about his anger or his drug problem. What they need to do is say, where did you get your drug problem from? It's a symptom. Well, I said, I, I, I'm on drugs all the time because I'm so angry. Well, where did you get so angry from? How did that happen? I say, well, my father and I never did get along. He left our family, and I'll never forget that. And I said, did you ever forgive him? That's it. You, he, he starts to forgive right here, and the whole thing is over. The whole thing comes down. Then 
you know, after repentance, then there's healing. And, you know, you get just this pile of bricks over here, you know. But it's not, there's no real, um, um, you know, it's not a stronghold anymore. It's just a demolished building. And then you just bring healing into there and you remove it. And healing just takes away some of that junk. And then the Lord, you know, he could do it all at once, but most people won't let him. And um, then you get some more healing prayer, and more of that junk goes. And then, you know, you kind of open your heart, and more of it goes. And then, you know, it's all gone. And, you know, here you are. You're, you're a clean slate for the Lord. You know, you have... And, and, and then when you're growing, these things are not there anymore. They, they will not hinder your growth. You'll have problems, but they won't be because of all that junk that had been built up before you got to know the Lord. Or even since you got to know the Lord, if you fell into sin and did not repent and receive healing. So you see how important it is to clear the site, and you do that by demolishing the sin center. And that example I gave, the sin center was unforgiveness. Okay? Do you, do you see how this works? And this is, this is really important. We just have to be able to do this. I'm going to ask our brothers and sisters who are here in the studio audience, uh, maybe they could give uh, some testimonies from their life for people that they know or even ask questions on, on how to deal with the sin center. Of course, it's by, it's the obvious question a lot of times we have is say, how did you know that unforgiveness was a problem? And even if you knew unforgiveness was a problem, how could you have dealt with it since obviously it had been there for a long time? Well, through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will show you that. A good example of that is, for example, John chapter 4, where the uh, w Samaritan woman, she has got a, got a whole stronghold of the devil. She's been married five times. The person she's with now, she's not married to. Uh, and so she's got lust up here. I think you get married five times, there's a problem. And she's um, probably got selfishness and fear, anxiety, you know. But you know what Jesus did when Jesus, you say, well, Jesus got to the part of that problem, that was lust. When he said, you've been, you got five husbands, the ones you're with now is not your husband, he got to the heart of the problem. I don't think that was it. I think he just... Um, showed his power there. I think the heart of the problem was probably self-hatred. A lot of people involved with lust, the heart of it is self-hatred. But see, she was a Samaritan woman. Being a woman, Jesus shouldn't be talking to her. Being a Samaritan, Jesus shouldn't be talking to her. But Jesus is talking to her. And Jesus shows respect for her. Jesus, even when he said, you've got five husbands, the ones you're with now is not your husband, he, did, he was not saying, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to threaten you, I'm going to tell you how bad you are. He was telling the truth, but he still loved her. He still loved her by his unconditional love, by his love that was, not, that was not ruined by bigotry or racism. He was able to let that woman be loved unconditionally for the first time. That transformed her self-hatred, and then the lust and everything else just came down. Now, I can't prove all the details of that, but that is at least what I would think would be a possible demolition of her sin center and she would just be an example and she got that experience she felt that she didn't just feel like Jesus had helped her when she went back to that to her her city and told everybody but she didn't say Jesus help me straighten out with my marriages he, she didn't say that she said he told me everything I've ever done now he didn't do that but when you remove the sin center everything you ever done falls apart and you feel that total experience of of God changing things so any, any comments, questions, witnesses about these things from our, our studio audience? They look so um, <laughs> astute. Uh, well, yep. I was just thinking about um, uh, family relationships, and uh, especially when I was a lot, uh, a lot younger, there was a lot of um, psychology that was thrown at us, and a lot of times it the focus was on, well, your parents did this and your parents did that, and, 
you know, you, you get sucked into this thing of, well, that's the reason I'm the way I am, because my parents did this and my parents did that, and you start focusing on their faults. And um, that, I think, it just feeds unforgiveness or something, and it's a, a blaming others. And then when I um, heard a teaching once about how the Lord says in His order, you have to respect your parents and love your parents, and even in their, uh, when they're old, you know, you love them and respect them. And I started praying about that. I realized that that was going to uh, be where I had to really repent and change my life. Started focusing on my mother especially. And um, God has done a really great thing in releasing a lot in my life just by being able to forgive her. Yeah. Okay, I'm glad you sh said that because, see, what I was referring to is something very common that a lot of people don't even uh, face the reality that there is a bunch of stuff built up from the past that needs to get out before we can make the full progress we should. And so a lot of people would deny all this stuff about, about uh, parents and say, well, that doesn't mean anything. But then you get to the other extreme, which is what you refer to. They face it, say, yeah, uh, before all these people said there wasn't anything to even think about, now there is, and it's really terrible, and you can't do anything about it. Well, now, wait a minute. Uh, one minute you won't face it. The next minute you face it as something that is impossible to deal with. Now that's not facing uh, other realities that Jesus can remove the most devastating sin center and the most devastating stronghold of the evil one. And um, so many times um, we, we kind of... Uh, we really jump onto this bandwagon of, of, the, of the old stuff that's affecting our lives because before we denied that and now we see how, how important that is and what a great insight that is. So we really jump on that bandwagon but you have to realize that Jesus is not just teaching us about this for no reason. He is showing us that we're, I'm showing you this so you can get rid of it not so you can just be bound by it forever. And so that's real important to see that. It's kind of funny, you know, the, the devil uh, lies from uh, two extremes. He says, oh, there's, no, there's nothing from the past. The past, we never, never nothing happened in the past. That's a lie. Yeah. And then he says, look what happened in the past. You can't do anything about it. You're doomed. That's a lie, too. You have to face it, but you have to face it that it can be moved. And that's Jesus' will that it be moved. But thank you. Any other comments on that or on, on the same line? Do, uh, uh. I don't know. I guess this is more of a question, and that is um, how do we know when we've hit that sin-centeredness? You know, is there a well, you get that experience like the how do you know if you hit the sin center? Well, it's, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. It isn't just some kind of guessing game. But um, you... Um, uh, you get that experience of the Samaritan woman. He told me everything I ever did. Now, he really didn't tell you everything. He'd only been talking to you for a few minutes. But you get that experience of the whole thing came tumbling down. You, know? you can kind of tell uh, like when they knock the top block off. You know, you just kind of say, well, that's not a, such a problem anymore. But I'm still bound up. You know, that, that's how you experience just this minimal repentance that really doesn't get deep down. But boy, when they pull the rug out from under, when they hit the sin center, you just kind of go, wow. You know, it's kind of Philippians 3, verse 7. The things I used to consider gain, I have now reappraised as lost in the light of my Lord Jesus Christ. You know, it's, it's a deeper experience of repentance. You feel like your whole life is just kind of tumbled because your whole past life has tumbled. It's an experience of a baptism repentance, an immersion, and it's a deeper experience, not just a feeling. You may not feel it. You may feel terrible. You may feel just kind of like overwhelmed by it. But, boy, your, your whole life just kind of just kind of fell, fell apart on you. And thank God it did because we need to get rid of it and move on to a new life. 
Okay, well, we're running out of time. I'm going to ask Jack, he's right here in the front row, to uh, pray over those who are in our studio audience. Uh, we only have, I don't know, a minute or two left. But I'm going to just ask him to lead us in a prayer that we would uh, get into serious repentance, but uh, not to be discouraged by, by the sins of our past, even though we face them head on and see how bad they are, but be encouraged and, and just repentance and healing. And we could come before the Lord and just clean before the Lord, just a blank slate and say, Lord, you ride on me. I've removed all the other stuff. You ride on me. So, Jack, lead us in prayer. As I pray, I extend my hands toward you. I ask you to put your hands in a receptive mode. Just receive what the Holy Spirit has for you. I ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you and to each and every one of us the, the sin centers that, that we have that's, that's holding up the whole building that Satan has built around us, the, the building of sin and unforgiveness. I just ask the Lord Jesus to touch us now and to heal us and to set us totally free that we'll have that sensation that the Samaritan woman had of being set totally free. Thank I you, ask the Lord to heal you in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.